With the release of Duality, Twitter has exploded with dungeon rankings from people all over the community. So naturally, I thought it'd be fun to take this idea a step further by deep diving into all five dungeons in order of release to create the ultimate tier list. This was all done live on stream with the help of my community, so if you'd like to get involved with something like this in the future, feel free to swing on by the stream over at twitch.tv slash above. We have a ton of fun and I have no doubt you'll enjoy your time with us. Anyways, without further ado, to do let's get into it we'll be breaking each dungeon down into six key components theme day one experience mechanics loon incentive replayability and the solo experience these six will combine into a total score that we'll use to give an overall grade to each dungeon which will then allow us to slot them into the ultimate tier list and kicking things off we have the shattered throne the theme of this dungeon is something special because it ties into the open world of the dreaming city as you guys may remember remember, when Last Wish was completed, it released the curse on the Dreaming City, and at the pinnacle of the three-week cycle, the Shattered Throne was discovered in a patrol zone. This is actually super special because it progresses the endgame story, and it also was a massive surprise to the Destiny community. This dungeon was the first of its kind, and to me, it's the perfect aesthetic to reflect the pinnacle source of the Dreaming City's curse. It has vast open spaces and a very eerie feeling to it, so for me, the theme has to be an A, seeing that it ties into the open world so perfectly. Next up, we have the day one experience, and as I mentioned, this was found in a patrol space, which was a total surprise and spectacle for the Destiny community. And what's crazy about this is that the power level of Shattered Throne was actually higher than Last Wish, which meant that this was the pinnacle activity in the Dreaming City. And though this limited the number of people who could run Shattered Throne on day one, I would argue it's one of the largest spectacles in Destiny history, making the day one experience S tier. Next up, we have mechanics, and starting things off, we have the opening encounter, which the first time through is pretty fun, but on repeat playthroughs is a bit of a slog, and we only have two bosses in this dungeon, if you can believe it. There's actually just a lot of walking and transition zones, and though they're cool, it's not the best experience to play through on repeat clears. One of my main gripes with this dungeon is the fact that Dulancaro's health pool is so small that she typically just gets run over by any weapon you bring into the boss room and you don't actually get to see most of her mechanics. So to me, I would have to give Shattered Thrones mechanics a C grade overall. Next up, we have Loot Incentive. And the sad thing is that the weapons and armor in this dungeon actually overlap with the Dreaming City. They did update this, but it took nearly two years to give these dungeon weapons unique perks to the Shattered Throne. And even then, I'm not sure it's enough at this point to make me want to go and farm it. We did have the wish ender quest which was awesome but the bow's never been meta and what's interesting is that there's actually no solo flawless emblem for this dungeon either just one for soloing it so in terms of loot incentive for a solo or team-based player there's not a whole lot to go off of here so i'd have to give it a d for loot incentive next up we have replayability and something that's interesting that you guys may not know is that this dungeon was actually only available once every three weeks at the pinnacle of the curse of the dreaming city City, which is cool because it aligned with the story, but isn't super practical for players who want to go and grind the new dungeon. And they just recently updated this dungeon to actually be farmable. It used to be just one clear per character per week, and it has a lot of walking and transition zones, the opening encounter is a slog, and there are still no rally flags to this day. So in terms of replayability, I would have to grade the Shattered Throne as a C. And lastly, we have the solo experience, and to me, I find most of the encounters to be relatively manageable for solo players. I think the health pools of these bosses could definitely be increased, but for a solo player, it's a great place to get started in soloing dungeons. And it's also very immersive if you are a solo player. There's definitely moments where you're kind of in awe of the environment around you, and though there's no solo flawless emblem to chase, there is still a solo emblem, so I have to give it a little bit of credit there. Overall, I'd find the solo experience to be a B in the Shattered Throne, which actually lines up with my overall grade for this dungeon, I'm going to give the Shattered Throne a B, but I'll bump its grade up a little bit because it was the first and paved the way for the rest of the dungeons we have now, so overall, I'll give the Shattered Throne a B+. The next dungeon on our list is the Pit of Heresy, and this was met with extremely high expectations because, let's be honest, the Shattered Throne set a very high bar. So, let's dive into the theme. The opening encounter makes one thing abundantly clear. We're diving into the depths of 
hell, and we have an army that's going to meet us there. The Hive Fortress that cascades down the cliffside is one of the coolest skyboxes in Destiny, period, at the bottom of which you can actually see the boss arena awaiting you at the end of your journey. I also love the jumping puzzle in this dungeon. It gives off massive Saw movie vibes, and the walk up to the boss room is something to be admired. It's definitely one of the best skyboxes we have in Destiny, period. To me, it's the middle portions of this dungeon that are a little lackluster. It kind of just feels samey to the rest of the Shadow Keep DLC, but overall, I think the theme is pretty outstanding, and I would give it a B plus. Next up, we have the Day 1 experience, and this is one that was more accessible to players than the Shattered Throne. There wasn't a massive power climb, and to me, the Day 1 felt pretty easy. I think our team finished our run in 45 minutes, and in my opinion, that's not necessarily a good thing. I do enjoy challenge in new endgame activities, especially pinnacle content like this, but it did make it more accessible to a wider player base, so it's not necessarily a bad thing. Not every dungeon has to be the pinnacle of difficulty. With all of that said, this day one experience doesn't really stand out all that much in my memory. It just kind of happened, so I would have to give this day one experience a C. Next up, we have mechanics, and one of the things that stands out the most for me was actually the opening encounter and the interactions with the relic. You had three different attacks to damage three different types of bosses, and I actually thought this was really cool because we hadn't really done much with relics in the past. The next thing I want to note is the totem encounter, which is actually one of my favorite. I think it gives good difficulty to this dungeon in the middle section of it, but unfortunately, the ball dupe just ruined this encounter for over two years. So a lot of that difficulty just wasn't present for the longest time. And to me, that's a huge killer in the overall rating. I also don't love that the boss encounter pretty much just emulates what the opening encounter does, but adds the fact that you have to dunk a few balls and stand in a circle to damage the boss. So overall, I think the mechanics are a little lackluster and I would have to give them a B minus. Next up, we have Loot Incentive, and we'll start by talking about the Solo Flawless Emblem. Though this emblem is a bit tainted because of the ball duping that I did mention earlier, it's still one of the best emblems in the game, hands down. Now, on the flip side of this, the only exclusive piece of loot from this dungeon is the Premonition Pulse Rifle, while the rest of the loot pool actually is shared with the moon. I thought they would learn their lesson from Shattered Throne, but clearly we just made the same mistake twice. This dungeon was updated to drop high stat armor with two guaranteed 16 plus stats, which is a fantastic change, but this took over a year to do, so there was a year where this dungeon just wasn't farmed at all. There was also an exclusive ship, but this created a ton of controversy because it wasn't themed like the dungeon at all. Instead, the dungeon themed items were put in Eververse, which actually led Bungie to put out a statement that said they would never put activity themed cosmetics in Eververse again. We also have the Xenophage quest, which was definitely a saving grace for this this dungeon, so overall, I would have to give the loot incentive a C, but this is a hesitant rating because, let's be honest, there's really not a lot going for it. Next up, we have replayability, and as I mentioned before, with loot incentive, virtually zero. You couldn't farm armor, there were basically no unique weapons, and the emblem and Xeno were one time only. So, in terms of replayability, I would have to give this a C as well. And lastly, we have the solo experience, which is definitely tainted. This was the easiest solo flawless with ball duping in the game because you could do it at both totems and the final boss, which meant all you had to do was get past the jumping puzzle and the opening encounter, which wasn't too much of a challenge. The boss is pretty easy if you take it slow, and nowadays it's actually a great entry point for solo dungeon runners, so overall, I would give the solo experience of this dungeon a B-, and if we tally all of these grades together, Pit of Heresy is going to rank as the lowest dungeon on our list today coming in with an overall grade of a C. Next up, we have Prophecy, a dungeon that was released during Season of Arrivals and the six-month wait leading up to Beyond Light. This helped tide players over, and the theme is definitely one that is memorable to me personally. I personally think that Bungie nailed the theme of the Nine. It's simplistic, yet beautiful and eerie all at the same time. Rainbow Road is the perfect example of this. I'd argue that it's probably the most visually impressive skybox we have in Destiny, period. The desert transition pays homage 
homage to sunset locations, which was really cool. And the boss encounter is visually impressive as well, giving off those Inception Doctor Strange vibes where the walls mirror each other. I absolutely adore this dungeon's aesthetic, and I would have to give its theme an S tier grade. Next up, we have the day one experience, and this is one of the most memorable for me personally, because I remember watching the Season of Arrivals reveal trailer, and at the end of it, they told us that we were getting a dungeon that was coming out that very day. The hype was immeasurable, and it led to a crazy grind that took place all day long. Now, this was exhausting, and it led to most people being very underleveled for their first day one run of this, but this also meant that it was a very good challenge. It was accessible to all players because it was the first free-to-play dungeon, and the Rainbow Road reveal on the day one of the dungeon was one of the most memorable experiences I've ever had in gaming, so overall, I'd have to give this day one experience a B+. Next up, we have mechanics, and normally, I would knock this immediately for having moats involved at all. I'm extremely sick of moat-based mechanics, but I really did enjoy the light and dark spin on it, and I actually found the cube room to be pretty interesting the first time that we did it. However, on replays, it's very, very boring and drawn out. The boss fight, however, I think is one of the best fights we have in Destiny 2, period. It counters sitting in a well and kind of emulates that chase mechanic that you get with Shuro Chi. So overall, even though we have moats and the cube room is somewhat boring on replay, I would still have to give this dungeon a B for mechanics. Next up, we have loot incentive, and this actually changed multiple times throughout this dungeon's life cycle. The OG loot pool included things like the Seraph hand cannon, death adder, and the armor, which was pretty cool, but it was later updated with reprised trials weapons that were highly requested from the Destiny community and fit the dungeon theme much better. It also has an amazing solo flawless emblem, an exclusive sparrow, and a ghost shell as well, and I think all of them look pretty cool. It's also worth noting that this dungeon is farmable, which was a first for all of the Destiny dungeons, so overall I have to give the loot incentive a B+. And these points tie directly into the next category, which is replayability. High stat armor farming was very popular with this boss, especially because, as I noted earlier, this was the first farmable dungeon. And the Trials of the Nine update gave this dungeon a second life, and people went crazy farming for these weapons. This dungeon also has unique loot pools for each encounter, which means you can farm whatever encounter you want for the piece of loot that you're chasing, which I find to be really enjoyable from a player experience perspective. So overall, I would give the replayability a B plus. Lastly, we have the solo experience, and I find this dungeon to be a very solid challenge as a solo player. It's a difficult solo flawless, and it rewards you pretty well for your time invested. You have an amazing solo flawless emblem, as well as a ghost shell and a sparrow on top of it, so overall, I would give the solo experience an A, and something that solo players can aspire to complete once they've got into solo dungeon running. With all of these factors taken into account, I give the Prophecy Dungeon an overall grade of an A. It's absolutely outstanding and is definitely one of my favorites to date. Next up, we have the Grasp of Avarice, a dungeon that was released with the 30th anniversary update. And thank god it was, because this was the saving grace on the wait for Witch Queen. Diving into its theme, there's something special about this dungeon that just feels different from every other dungeon in the game. It has a fun factor and that lighthearted spirit that I absolutely love in Destiny. It has incredible music that matches the pirate theme. It pays homage to the OG loot cave, which I absolutely love, and it all revolves around around treasure and the fallen protecting that treasure. It has that fun factor of traps that just had me laughing with my buds, so overall the theme is easily an S tier grade for me, it's some of the most fun I've had in Destiny. Next up we have the Day 1 experience, and this was very accessible to anyone that owned the 30th anniversary update. There was no crazy power climb to participate, it was super fun in a fire team, they interwove it with the Galahorn quest, and it also gave us the first ever master dungeon on the day one of release, so for a day one experience, this also gets an S tier grade. Next up, we have mechanics, and this is basically just an improved version of moat banking, but it did fit the treasure theme well because they had you picking up engrams instead, which was kind of cool. There was a fun mechanic where if you picked up 10 engrams, that it would give you your super, but I'd argue it actually makes this dungeon too easy. And lastly, I personally find the boss fight to be extremely bland. It doesn't really 
really innovate from the other encounters. It's kind of just there. So overall, I would give the mechanics of this dungeon a C plus, and I think a lot of players would agree. Next up, we have Loot Incentive, and this is where this dungeon really shines. We have a solo flawless emblem that fits the pirate theme perfectly, and a shader for a team flawless. We were also given the first ever artifice armor as a master award, which not only had a dope thorn theme, it was also super useful in endgame PvE content. We were also given reprised weapons such as Ias Luna and 1k Stare, which were highly requested from the community, and to top it all off, we were given Gallahorn and the Galley Catalyst as part of this dungeon, so overall, I've gotta give the loot incentive for Grasp of Avarice an A. Next up, we have Replayability, and this is huge with this dungeon as well, because this dungeon is farmable with great loot to farm. The Artifice Armor was a huge incentive to replay it, and it's fun to play with friends and kindergartens alike. I think it's a great entry dungeon for you to take friends through. The Engram Super Mechanic makes it very easy, which I think kind of deters players who prefer harder content, and the Servitor Encounter is an absolute slog to replay through after your first clear, so for replayability, I would give this dungeon a B plus. And lastly, we have the Solo Experience, where the solo for this dungeon is actually relatively easy, but is very time consuming. The Ogre and Servitor Encounters are extremely long, and the water in the boss room can be so frustrating because if you even dip a toe in, you're dead. Overall, I think it's a good intro to solo dungeons, but it's very drawn out and you have to play extremely safe and patient to get this thing done, so I'd give the solo experience a C. This brings us to our overall grade, which I think is going to surprise some people, of an A, lining up with prophecy in terms of overall quality. This brings us to the last dungeon on our list, and the newest dungeon for Destiny in Duality. Diving into the theme, I personally find the storytelling and theme to be heavily intertwined with the Destiny universe. Kallus' saga, not only with Keitel, but the light and darkness storyline is something I find super intriguing, and I love that this dungeon reimagines the Menagerie and Leviathan in nightmare form. The dialogue is absolutely incredible throughout this dungeon, and as I mentioned before, it ties into a large larger overarching story, so to me, I find the theme to be S tier. Next up, we have the Day 1 experience, and this dungeon was actually the first to split the release of the dungeon from the start of the new season, and I personally love that change because it allowed us to play the new seasonal content first and level up for the dungeon in the meantime at a pretty casual pace. The dungeon is fantastic on the first playthrough as a fire team, with Master available immediately as well. Though I will say on our first playthrough, it felt like there was just a lot of BS with things like backpacks, exploding, dying to the bell, getting booped off the map by incendiors, but as you replay it on additional playthroughs, you kind of learn how to counter that stuff. And I also want to note that this is the first fully farmable dungeon, which means if you go through on the same character multiple times, you can get new loot on each clear, even after you've done your looted run for the week, which I personally find to be an incredible quality of life change. So to me, the day one experience of this has to be be an A. Next up, we have mechanics, and what I love about duality is that it's very unique when compared to other dungeons. It requires a lot of communication with you and your fire team, and with practice, can be sped up significantly. I also love that the mechanic ties into the story with the two sides of Callus's mind, being the nightmare and normal realms, and I think it's an actual super fun mechanic to take part in. Lastly, I like that the boss mechanic ramps up significantly and feels punishing. It feels like you're actually fighting a real boss. Keitel moves extremely quickly, which means you need to be on top of ad clear and positioning to be successful, so overall, I find the mechanics of this dungeon to be a solid A. Next up, we have Loot Incentive, and this is by far the best of any dungeon we've seen to date. We have a dungeon-exclusive exotic and catalyst, dungeon-exclusive weapons that are not only S-tier for gameplay, but also look incredible aesthetically. We have a dungeon-exclusive title, a solo flawless emblem, and though the armor is lackluster, I don't really think it's at the fault of the dungeon, it seems like it was swapped with the season pass, and lastly, we have artifice armor from Master, which is even more of an incentive to farm the hardest difficulty of this content. Overall, the loot incentive is an easy S tier grade. Next up, we have replayability, and for me, I find this dungeon to be a solid challenge. It's fun to learn and optimize, as I mentioned earlier. This dungeon allows you to complete triumphs to increase 
increase the drop chance of the dungeon exotic and earn your title. You can also go for a solo flawless emblem and ship for master. It's fully farmable loot wise and there's very little downtime in this dungeon. I don't have that feeling of a slog like I get with the opening of Shattered Throne or the Servitor encounter in Grasp of Avarice. It's just fun to play through which makes the replayability S tier as well. And lastly we have the solo experience and to me the solo flawless is the best challenge for the most experienced players of any dungeon we have in the game. It requires practice and patience but as I mentioned before it can be optimized for speed. However the only knock I have against this is the fact that there is a lot of BS currently with backpacks exploding, incendiaries booping you off the map, and bell physics randomly killing you, but I do love the fact that the solo completion increases the drop rate of the exotic and progresses your title, and we have a solo flawless emblem. Granted, it's not the greatest in my personal opinion, so overall, though players have been molding over the past week, I personally find the solo experience to be a B+, bringing the overall grade of this dungeon to S tier, which makes it the highest graded dungeon that we have to date. In order, we have Duality at an S tier, Grasp of Avarice and Prophecy at A tier, we have Shattered Throne in the B tier, but gets a little bit of a boost because it was the first that paved the way for all these other fantastic dungeons, and last, we have Pit of Heresy in the C tier. So, what do you guys think about the tier list? Do you guys think I got it right, or are there things you guys want to roast me about down in the comments? Definitely feel free to leave your feedback, and again, I hope you guys enjoyed the video, it was a ton of fun to put together, and I want to give a special thank you to all my Discord members who helped source footage, and of course, all of those links to the footage will be linked down in the description below. Anyways, guys, thank you again so much for watching, and I'll catch you in the next one. Peace!